What's cracking, big dokes? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. This is B D G E. Big dogs got E fantasy football. My name is Nicholas. Today, we are doing a 2020 fantasy football mock draft. And I know we've talked all summer about only doing super flex stuff, but I want to show some love to the one quarterback leagues. I want to show love to some mainstream. Listen. Listen, I know I'm a hipster, and my channel has almost turned into a hipster channel. We like to get niche. We like to get into the nitty-gritty. We like to cater to who we want to cater to. But at the end of the day, like any artist, like any creative, I'm not a creative or an artist. I'm just an idiot. But like any idiot, you also need to serve the mainstream. And that's what we're going to do today. I think there's going to be a lot of good player analysis that y'all can, you know, grab from today's video regardless of if you're in a super flex or not so we're on the sleeper app and the sleeper app is arguably hello uh one of the best if not the best platform to mock draft on so that's sleeper.app they have no affiliation with me as of this video they also have an actual app on the mobile phone which you could download i would say this and the fantasy pros draft wizard just google that if you want to use it are the best for mock draft so what you could do is when you sign up on sleeper uh you just click the section over here that says draft boards and then there's a big create my draft board and here's what you're going to do then you're going to go to the settings in the top right and we're going to do a 12 teamer half ppr one quarterback league but we're also going to do something a little bit different so half ppr 2020 fantasy football mock draft one quarterback half ppi three wide receivers starting. So I've moved in. Maybe you guys are still doing the normal three wide receivers, two running backs thing. Uh, most of my leagues have transitioned to two running backs, two wide receivers, two regular flexes and the super flex, which I like. But I feel like this year has gotten a little out of hand with just only drafting running backs. And I'm going to get into the, some of the analytics behind that and why it's so powerful this year, especially, and especially if you're playing in two wide receiver leagues. But I think a lot of the default settings, and maybe I'm wrong here, maybe they've changed it over the last couple of years, but unlike Yahoo and ESPN and those platforms, most of the starting lineups, I believe, do three wide receivers. So this video is going to cater mostly to y'all, but to everybody as well, just from the pure player analysis. So we're going to go 12 teams, half PPR, bing, bang, boom, roster settings. I have unsafe changes. Why is there three quarterbacks? We're going to add a third wide receiver. We're going to take out the super flex and we'll do whatever five five bench spots cool update draft order i have not taken a team yet uh we are going to i'm gonna smack my ti-84 all the numbers there as you can see it is clear i'm just gonna smack the fucking keyboard and whatever number i end up smacking will be my draft slot i guess i can't really do a double digit slot unfortunately but don't fucking matter we got parentheses how you doing i maybe the parentheses Maybe that's actually code word. We're going to go with one there because maybe that's like the beginning of the equation, the beginning of the draft. So we're going to go with the 101. And we're going to start our draft. Begin the draft. I believe computers will auto pick. So I'm on the clock at the 101. I think the choice is pretty obvious here. I'm not going to waste too much time talking about Mr. Christian McCaffrey. A lot of changes going on in Carolina. New quarterback in Teddy Bridgewater. They bring in Joe Brady from LSU, who was the prior offensive coordinator. And they have Mr. Rule, uh, the former Baylor head coach, coming in. So a lot of offensive mindedness. And that's, I mean, the, listen, they're, they brought in nobody to compete with Christian McCaffrey in terms of carries. Maybe someone starts taking more short yardage work. We, we don't give a shit about short yardage work when it comes to Christian McCaffrey. We want the receptions. The guy lives in the triple digit reception mark year over year. We expect it again. We got check down Teddy, who I think is a little better than we're giving credit for. Defense is going to be terrible. They're going to be in catch up mode. There's nothing about Christian McCaffrey that should deter you away from the 101 being him all right so we're just not going to do the auto picks love when this happens i always forget what setting it is within sleeper that i got to click to make the auto picks time per pick why does it do this Let CPU auto pick. Am I gonna have to do this for every? All right, I'm done rambling. I promise. I figured out how to do it. So when you're in draft settings, you actually have to set it to a timer. 
So that timer is just going to be how much time you actually have to pick. And then you just click CPU auto pick when user runs out of time. And then it shall be beautiful, beautiful automation. After that, we're going to resume the draft. After CMAC, we have Saquon, Josh Jacobs at the 103 sleeper. You are out of control. You are off your rocker. But we are seeing some realistic draft picks right now because no wide receivers are going. This is beautiful because it ties into what I kind of want to talk about. We're going to let each of these go by, and then I will dive into a little bit of analysis on what I think about the picks that happened. So we had Saquon, Josh Jacobs. The first eight picks were all running backs. Um, and it makes sense, but I think it makes less sense when you're playing in a league where you have to start three wide receivers. Why do I say this? Uh, it's pretty common sense, but even in a league where you're starting two wide receivers, here's here, here's the math behind it. The way you have to look at it is not only do like the high-end running backs give you the biggest positional advantage, right? On a points-per-game basis, like the RB1 or two, when you get an elite running back, they put you so far ahead of the running backs that are like RB10 or RB12 or RB15 or whatever, whereas, you know, the wide receiver three who is considered elite is really not that far ahead of the wide receiver 12 or 13 on a points per game basis. So the positional advantage you get is great, but what makes it even more important is the actual positional scarcity within is it scarcity, scarcity, scarce, it's definitely scarcity, positional scarcity within the actual position in the NFL. So we basically have, I would say like 25 usable fantasy running backs on any given week in fantasy football. Maybe you could push that to 30. How many starting running back slots do you have in fantasy football? You have 24, right? Each team gets two. So I think the way to look at positional scarcity is divide the number of usable players at a certain position, you know, and I don't mean physically usable, like, okay, you know, this guy is the starting, run like last year, like fucking Patrick Laird was the starting running back for Miami. Like he's not usable in 95% of fantasy leagues. I'm just talking about the starting positions. I'm not talking about deeper flex plays. We just want to get the overarching math so you understand the, the premise of what I'm talking about here. You have, you know, 25 to 30 starting running backs. You divide that by 24 slots, right? And that's where the math comes from in terms of positional scarcity because you can only start or, you know, you, there has to be at least 24 starting running backs in fantasy football. Right. And that number comes out to like 1.04. If it's 25 divided by 24, you look at quarterbacks, right? You have probably about 20, maybe 25 starting quarterbacks. And this is why uh, quarterbacks are so much less important in one quarterback leagues, because the positional scarcity when it comes to quarterbacks is is very, very high. The division there, the number, the equation there comes out to a much higher number when you only have 12 starting spots among your fantasy league, right? So you're getting 25 or 30 divided by 12. That number is double the number of running backs. So when you double that back up, quarterbacks and super flex realistically become almost just as valuable because now you have about 25 worthy starting running backs in fantasy. And in super flex or two quarterback leagues, you have about 25 to 30 starting quarterbacks. The reason... The reason on on that running backs tend to go before quarterbacks and super flex and you want to get your running backs first is going back to point one. So the positional scarcity is about the same, but the elite advantage you have with the elite running backs. Right. And obviously there are years where you have Lamar Jackson who outpaces the rest of the quarterbacks and he gives you an almost Christian McCaffrey type advantage in super flex. But for the most part, you're getting the quarterback one scoring, you know, two to three points per game more than the other quarterbacks. Right. In Lamar Jackson's case, it was like five or six. But when it comes to running backs, you're getting the Christian McCaffrey scoring like six or seven more points per game than, you know, the RB7. or the, it's, it's a crazy, crazy delta there. And that's why both of the positional scarcities are the same. But the high end advantage you get on a positional points per game basis is higher for running backs. So we put running backs in the pecking order in, of terms in, of importance. We put quarterbacks as second and super flex, but they're like dead last when it comes to one quarterback leagues. Then when you go to wide receiver, think about it from a common sense standpoint. At any given week, you have the wide receiver one on any offense, NFL, right? And that is 32 startable wide receivers. For the most part, almost every team has a wide receiver two that is startable in fantasy. We're, we won't say every one of them, but we'll, we'll say 20, maybe 18 of them have startable wide receiver twos. So that gets the number up to about 50. And then we have scattered wide receiver threes, which I think you could probably add in another 10 or 12 of those guys. And you're getting about 60 to 65 usable fantasy wide receivers that you could throw into your wide receiver slot on any given week. Now, when it comes to that percentage, again, going back to the scarcity over how many players can uh, actually be drafted or start in your lineup, that number 
gets extremely, extremely unadv- unadvantageous as the wide receiver slots get smaller. So if you're only starting two wide receivers and you have the ability to start, you know, any of 60 wide receivers, that's 60 divided by 24. That number is 2.5. It's more than double the importance of a running back. When the number is three starting wide receivers, obviously that number goes 60 divided by like 36. And the importance becomes a little bit more, but still much lower than running backs. Still a lot higher than quarterbacks, a lot higher than tight ends. Because you look at tight ends, there's probably about 15 usable fantasy tight ends divided by 12 starting spots within the league. So that number is closer to actual running backs than it is wide receivers. And again, it goes back to a lot more niche things like the actual positional advantage and the points per game basis and shit like that. But I wanted to give you guys the overarching theme of why running backs are getting hammered so hard. It is to do with the top end advantage points per game basis. It is also to do with the scarcity of the position, which is so much lower when it comes to wide receivers. So that is why we're seeing so many damn running backs go off the board. We have 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Sorry that took so long, but we'll get back to the mock draft now. 13 running backs within the first 23 picks. We had Kelsey and George Kill go in the middle of the second round. I think that is about perfect value. We have Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson. That is where I cross the line. There's no shot I'm taking either of those guys in the middle to early second round because, again, the positional scarcity is just not there. And uh, to rely on a ridiculous points-per-game advantage for those guys year over year is something that I'm not willing to do. Yes, there will be a nice continuity point for the top of your team, but in terms of one quarterback leagues, you just don't want to reach that high because you'll be able to get a guy who will put up three to four points fewer per game, which is not a huge, huge gap eight rounds later in the draft. So we'll skip quarterback, obviously. Here uh, is where things get a little tough because we're talking about how we don't want to grab a quarterback. We're talking about how we don't necessarily want to go crazy on a wide receiver because the positional advantage, again, is just not there. Now, at the turn, you're going to have to reach probably for your guys a little bit. And the question becomes... How early is too early for Mark Andrews? If we're in a half PPR league, I don't think he's a terrible pick here. Obviously, I'm not taking a quarterback. Running backs, I really don't see much value. I do like Clyde Edwards-Hilaire here a lot, though. This is about where I think he should be going in drafts. At the beginning of the post-NFL draft process, a lot of people were super high on him, including myself, where he was going around this spot, the probably the turn in the first round. And the more we heard about Damian Williams rumors and reports, guys, you got to be able to pivot. You got to be able to understand the reports that are coming out. If the Chiefs keep saying that Damian Williams is going to be involved, guess what? Probably going to be fucking involved. So uh, I think there needs to be pause for Clyde Edwards Hilaire. And now he's going as like the RB14, RB15, which I can get behind. I still think he's going to get involved. So I will use, based on the fact that the positional scarcity, again, is very, very, very low and very demanding when it comes to running backs in fantasy. I'll take Clyde edwards here because for me, he's like the last guy in this tier. I honestly don't hate Chris Carson either. I think we'll see his ADP continue to rise, but we'll go Clyde here. We'll get our guy. I forgot I got to unpause the draft. What are we doing, Nicholas? Resume draft. There we go. There we go. There we go. So we get Clyde to pair with Christian McCaffrey. And the second pick, we're looking at no wide receivers here that I think are in the tier uh, where I'd be willing to take them at the 3-1. Like if Godwin had fallen here, if any of these five guys or Godwin had fallen to 3-1 here, I would consider it. I like DJ Moore too. I think this is probably a little bit early for him in redraft. Love him in dynasty here. I like Allen Robinson a lot here too. Uh, I think he has very high potential to be the wide receiver five or better this year. I'll talk about that for a little bit. I think one of the key points, and I'm going to talk about Allen Robinson in depth in one of my upcoming videos. A lot of people don't understand. Allen Robinson was third in the NFL last year in targets. Third. He had 154 targets last year. Only Julio and Michael Thomas had more targets than Allen Robinson, and he could not have had worse quarterback play. I don't. People are hesitant to put... Allen Robinson back in that alpha range, but guys, he's there. He's got the alpha volume. He just needs an uptick in efficiency, which I think he's going to get from Nick Foles. As terrible as that is to say, but Allen Robinson has very, very high-end potential this year for, uh, don't write him off because he's in the Chicago Bears offense, man. The volume was insane last year, so just a tiny uptick in efficiency in in terms of like catchable targets. He was very low in catchable target rate. I, I Allen Robinson would probably be my next wide receiver off the board here, but because again, we talk about wide receivers and having so many to choose from 
I'm still going to fade actually Mark Andrews here probably. No, you know what? We're going to go with Mark Andrews. As I talked about in last two or in Tuesday's video, uh, one of the bus proof players is Mark Andrews. Guys, he played on 42% of the snaps last year. 42% of the snaps, which was 39th among tight ends last year. He ran 295 routes for the Ravens last year, which was 25th in the NFL. Still finished as a top three tight end in fantasy. That number with Hayden Hurst out, who was their second pass catcher in the offense, that number is going to jump from 42 to who fucking knows. I would not be surprised whatsoever if he was, you know, toe to toe, fucking punch for punch, pound for motherfucking pound with Kelsey and Kittle all year all year long. Just get him 70 percent of the routes. Just get him 70 percent of the snaps this year. And Mark Andrews is going to be a very, very good tight end option. So the fact that this is uh, another positional scarcity position i'm going to stop saying scarcity for your guys' sake and your ears uh we're actually going to go with mark andrews here and see how we end up with in the wide receiver position i could fade mark andrews here and get darren waller like probably two or three rounds later but we're gonna say fuck it and take mark mark andrews because that's our fucking boy this year ew levitt at three three see this third round is just disgusting value at running back i don't even like the wide receivers are getting picked right now so that's why i don't even Fuck around with this. I'm just taking my guys. I'm not trying to be like, oh, this is such a good value pick. Allen Robinson at the 4-4. Four, four, you love that. If he didn't fuck up his Mark Ingram at 3-9. I am drafting against computers, guys, by the way. um, I didn't realize his top bar was up here, though. Okay, so we are up at the 4-12 and the 5-1. If this was the tight end premium league, I would smash Mark Andrews again here. But, see, this this is why you take the running backs early, man. This is really why you do it, because there's nothing at running back you want here. Like, yeah, I like Jonathan Taylor. I actually don't think he's a terrible pick here at the 4-12-5-1, but who knows what that timeshare is going to look like throughout the entire year with Marlon Mack there. Who knows if he gets, you know, 15 fucking targets in the passing game. Just not a good look there for Taylor. So I'm really glad we got our running backs early, because now still look at the wide receivers here. Like, I, I faded running backs, and I could still get Juju and Robert Woods, DJ Moore and Robert Woods, DJ Moore and, and Odell Beckham here. And, you know, this is like, I'm not here to really go in on like, oh, I need to draft these two instead of these other three because you guys will have, okay, well, I guess y'all just made that decision for me. You guys will have different rankings than me. Like, some of you guys will love to smash, like, the bounce back players and Juju and Odell here. I might like to go a little more safety in terms of Robert Woods and DJ Moore. I'm actually going to take back that Robert Woods pick because I did not choose that. Um, and I'm going to go with DJ Moore and I'm going to go with DJ Moore and Juju. I've had very few shares of Juju in my mock drafts or any drafts for that sake because he's usually going around like the end of the third round. Do I think that Juju has a big bounce back year? I, I don't think his ceiling is going to be anywhere near people what people want it to be, which is what kind of concerns you a little bit. But since we already have the upside at the other positions, I'm not really looking for huge ceiling plays at wide receiver. If you give me Juju and DJ Moore, who I think will probably rack you up a good 12 to 14 receptions per game, uh, you're going to have a really nice floor at the wide receiver position there. And then DJ Moore again... Um, you know what? I did kind of make a mistake there, and I want to talk about this because I've talked about stacking players before. And I'm very fine stacking players. I'm really okay with stacking players. My rule of thumb is they have to be on a very good offense. Not one that you think might project to be a good offense. It needs to be Ravens-esque. It needs to be Kansas City Chiefs-esque. It needs to be one of those offenses. Otherwise, I would not mix and match Christian McCaffrey, DJ Moore. Because we like the setup with Joe Brady. We like Matt Rule coming in. We like Teddy Bridgewater coming in. But nothing there is guaranteed. We are not having. We have a summer which they're not going to prepare together. And they have everything is new. New quarterback, new scheme, new offense. Like, this could go south. This could easily go south. And this could be a team that just turns the ball over two, two, to, three game, two to three times a game. And if, if this is a team that, bottom, that averages, you know, 20 points a game, not there's almost no shot that both Christian McCaffrey and DJ Moore are going to be awesome fantasy players for you. And if you look back at last year, obviously Christian McCaffrey was the RB one. DJ Moore ended up as almost a top 10 wide receiver. He might've actually snuck into the back end of the wide receiver one range because of his consistency. I'm not willing to bet on a team that was bottom 10 in scoring to be able to replicate and have two high end fantasy producers at the position. So 
going hindsight, just not thinking about it, not looking at my team, being a fucking moron like I usually am on these videos, I would have gone elsewhere instead of DJ Moore, and I would have taken. I probably would have taken Robert Woods there. Um, so you guys get the point. Again, listen to my analysis here. Not so much like looking at my team, but we have a pretty solid starting lineup so far. Christian McCaffrey, Clyde edwards Lair, Juju, DJ Moore. And since we have to start three wide receivers, I might look back at this position again, even though uh, the, the computer was pretty sharp here. I would have probably have looked at one of these guys that was just picked. Terry McLaurin I would have loved, obviously. Hollywood Brown, Devontae Parker. Let's browse around. So not much value at the quarterback position. This is also the reason why I want to wait on. Not, I don't even want to wait on quarterback, but I love the idea of drafting one of these middle round guys. You see Wilson, Watson, my, uh, Kyler Murray, Dak Prescott. And I like that Murray and Prescott were the last ones picked because they're actually the three, four in my rankings. Prescott three, Kyler Murray four. What's crazy. And this is this is cool about playing in a lot of super flex and then switching over to one quarterback leagues. This should tell you this needs to tell you something. And this is something that I wrote up in the uh, in our draft guide, which went live two Wednesdays ago. A lot of strategy in there, a lot of stuff analysis based on the trends that I've seen throughout the summer. It's funny how in super flex leagues, Lamar Jackson and Patrick Mahomes, they're both usually top five picks. And then Kyler Murray, Dak Prescott, and these other quarterbacks are usually like four to five picks behind them, right? Like Dak, Dak and Kyler rarely exit the first round. Kyler, I've seen go as early as like the 106, the 107. But in one quarterback leagues, they drop almost four rounds. So the number of picks they're dropping in super flex leagues is almost equivalent to the number of rounds that they're dropping in one quarterback leagues. And that tells me that there's some kind of fucking delta there that we need to take advantage of. And it tells me that it's those guys in the sixth round, fifth, sixth round. So if you see Kyler, if you see Dak falling to the sixth round, I know we like to do late quarterbacks. But those are guys I'm going to smash at that ADP. I'll probably take Russ or Watson. They're probably in a tier that's a little bit behind those first two guys for me. Maybe them, are, those guys are okay in the seventh round. But I like Kyler. I like Dak in the sixth round. So those are guys I'd probably be looking at. But right now, this whole tier of quarterbacks, I kind of missed out on the guys I wanted. So I'll probably wait again until the next turn and see if there are any running backs that I – or there are any quarterbacks that I like. So running back wise, we have our two guys that we like Debo. You would look, man, I want to smash Debo here. I would smash Debo here if it weren't for the broken foot injury that he suffered. Um, unfortunately, that kind of puts him off your draft board for the most part. We are bringing Dr. Morse back onto the channel next Tuesday. We are filming tomorrow. We will talk about Debo. We will talk about coronavirus. We will talk about any injury that we're concerned with and all that kind of bullshit that also drops into the hemisphere of fantasy football. He'll be back on the channel next Tuesday's video. So we're going to skip on Debo Samuel for now. All of his injury write-ups, injury videos exclusive to the draft guide are in there right now. They are live. He's got an injury rating 1 to 10, whether or not you should be staying away from these guys for the 2020 season. If you want access to the draft guide, y'all, if you think the big facts that we're dropping today are good, your mind will be Alone. I was going to, you can't really use a simile or a metaphor with the word blown, like blown up. You know, everything is like disrespectful. You can't talk about anything being blown up because it's anything that's blown up is pretty fucked up. You know, there were like four that came into my head there. I was going to say blown up like, yeah, I'm just going to not say any of those things. I forget the fuck I was even talking about. Mock drafts are hard to do analysis on, man, because you just talk for like 45, 50 straight minutes. Typically, like the normal videos I do, I could take a breath. I could look at some of the notes I wrote and then come back to you with the big fikes. Come and bike with the big fikes. In mock draft setting, we don't edit shit. We just let it rip. We let it run straight from the straight from the fingertips, straight from the tongue. And, uh, and the draft guide is much more prepped. It's really fucking good, to be honest with you. If you go to monkeyknifefight.com and you deposit... Ten dollars on their site using the promo code BDGE when you deposit. You play a game on there of two dollars or more, you will get access to the draft guide within twenty four hours. I'll email you access to the draft guide as soon as you play a two dollar game after depositing with the promo code BDGE. That is how you get the draft guide. That is how you get the season long guide, the injury guide, the rookie dynasty guide, fucking all the guides, homies and homets. Let's talk fantasy football. Sorry. Um, so wide receivers, man, I don't like anyone at the six twelve here. 
I do not. I was hoping that Hollywood Brown fell to me, but it doesn't look like he did. We're probably going to wait on the value there, and we're probably going to hit a couple running backs. A lot of people are, are, are out on DeAndre Swift, man, and I, I'm going to probably take the bold stance that DeAndre Swift – is maybe not the number one because like Clyde probably has the clearest path to touches right now as that first round running back pick. But I really don't think it's crazy to expect DeAndre Swift to be the RB1 uh, amongst rookies if we're going a little bit bold. I just think like you look at all the other rookie running backs and they all have competition in certain parts of their game where they're not the best on their team. And DeAndre Swift comes in and there's no one that's better than him at running. There's no one that's better in that backfield at pass catching. There's no one that's more explosive. Like everything he brings to the field, he is making the other players in that backfield redundant. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm choosing to believe in DeAndre Swift. He was my rookie RB1 prior to the NFL draft. Got picked really early, second running back off the board. So I believe the talent wins out there. I think he's a special, special prospect. Like we like Carrion Johnson. He's a guy I've liked since he's been in the NFL. But he was never anyone I was like kind of pounding the table for. He's never anyone that I was like, oh, he's got elite talent. And I think like eventually he'll be an elite fantasy running back. DeAndre Swift, I really feel like he has Dalvin Cook type upside. So uh, DeAndre Swift is a guy that I am willing to kind of let sit on my my bench for the first month of the season. I think he takes over after that. So we're going to go with DeAndre Swift here, get our third running back. I think between Swift and Clyde edwards helaire we'll get one of those rookies to hit big. 7-1, this gets a little tough because we don't want to grab our quarterback yet. Wide receiver is just not a lot of value here, man. It's tough. Mm -hmm. Let me just check the ADPs, make sure they don't have anything stupid sitting down here. Not really. Tight end. Now, this is where, if I look back, maybe I would have pivoted. And instead of going with Mark Andrews there, we would have gone with Mike Evans or Adam Thielen. Or I probably should have went with my fucking boy, Allen Robinson, because then I could have had a killer stack of C-Mac, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, and DeAndre Swift at running back, and then Allen Robinson, Juju, and DJ Moore at wide receiver. God damn! And then at tight end, I easily just could have had Hunter Henry or Tyler Higby. See, this is why you do mock drafts, homies. This is why you do it, because you practice and you know next time, fuck it, I'm not taking a tight end early because we need them wide receivers, especially when you start three of them. I don't hate Tyler Boyd here, so we're actually just going to go off the rip and take Tyler Boyd. A lot of people are down on him, man. He is young. He is awesome. He is a good player. Back-to-back -back years of 1,000 yards. He's like 25, 26 years old. And, uh, and and now he's got Joe Burrow coming in. I, I don't think people realize how many targets Tyler Boyd had last year. He had like 140. He was top 10 in the league, if not even higher than that, maybe top seven or something in the league in total targets. And uh, y'all know I, have, I want nothing to do with A.J. Green because I highly doubt he plays the full season. He's old. He's coming off of multiple serious injuries. Like, fuck A.J. Green. I can't believe he just went two rounds earlier in the fifth round to Tyler Boyd. Uh, so I, I like Tyler Boyd as a very, very sneaky bat. I, I think he's like a... Not a poor man's Christian Kirk. I think he's a whatever the fucking a rich man's Christian Kirk. I don't know. Everyone's hyping up Christian Kirk as a value play, but I think Tyler Boyd is like the the better play here. Even if you have to grab him a round or two earlier, and the best thing is like Christian Kirk. Here you go. Is going down here where I can get both of them. Uh, I love Deontay Johnson as well, but I kind of like Christian Kirk because we know the volume is going to be there. He got over 100 targets last year, low key in 13 games. So. Christian Kirk is uh, another guy that I would like to pair here because I think we have a lot of safe wide receivers here. So if our running backs hit on the high upside, we don't really have to worry about our wide receiver or our running backs being really good or our wide receivers being really good. Sorry, I'm never paying attention. So we're going to go with Christian Kirk here as our first pick. And uh, since we need to start three wide receivers, obviously the bench players here at wide receiver are important because each of those guys has a buy. One of them is probably going to bust. One of them is going to get hurt. So Starting three wide receivers makes the depth more important. I don't know if it necessarily makes the high-end talent uh, more important, but it definitely makes the depth of needing to start three wide receivers a lot more important. So we've got four wide receivers. Uh, I'm, I don't really like any of the running backs in terms of where we're drafting right now. This is probably when I'd look to, to quarterback one. Carson Wentz is, is, the, is the play here for me. Him or, or Tom Brady. Or Daniel Jones, honestly. But I'll go with Wentz here. I think Wentz, we saw Wentz have top three upside. Uh, back in 2017, he was the quarterback three in fantasy points per game. Over the last five years, that would have been quarterback two in any of those other years. Only behind Lamar Jackson. He would have been the, the quarterback two last year behind Lamar Jackson. He would have been the quarterback two two years ago behind Patrick Mahomes. Uh, the quarterback two behind Aaron Rodgers in 2016, and the quarterback two behind Cam Newton in 2015. So outside of the year that he was quarterback three, you take that year and put it into any other year, he's the quarterback two in those years. And this is a crazy stat from Matt Kelly, and he might have stole it from someone else, but 
Carson Wentz became the first player last year, the first quarterback last year ever to throw for over 4,000 yards without having a receiver go for over 500 receiving yards. That is insane. That's like that's like a running back running for 1,300 or 14 yards with a bottom five offensive line and a team that scores in the bottom five of the NFL. Like, it's extremely impressive when you actually look at what he did not having any weapons there. Now, Deshaun Jackson, I don't even know if he's going to be on the fucking team with the the ridiculous things that he's been saying on social media. Love Jalen Rager. He's got the two tight ends. I, I think this team has sneaky, sneaky, good offensive upside that gives Wentz sneaky, elite fantasy quarterback. I think if there's any quarterback going outside those top like four elite guys that I was talking about, Kyler, Dak, Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, to be right behind Mahomes and Jackson, it is Carson Wentz. So uh, I really like Carson Wentz where we were able to get him down here at the um, – where was it? At the eight, at the nine one. Draft picks. Are you? Oh, you guys can't really see the board. Yeah, you can. Never mind. All right, so we got our quarterback, and I might draft another tight end a little bit later. We'll probably keep going with dart plays on the flexes. Do we like any of these running? Backs? All these running backs are handcuffs right now. Uh, I'm actually kind of getting a little bit more excited about Zach Moss because he's going to have that Gore role who had double digit carries almost every game last year. He had like 11 or 12 goal line carries, which was top 10 in the NFL. And I really think Zach Moss will have that role. So he doesn't have the ceiling, but he's got really good week over week floor. And we might need that if, you know, if Clyde or DeAndre Swift start in a, in a really strong committee. Um, So we might need some floor production out of a guy like Zach Moss. So we'll look at the wide receivers. Nothing I love here. I love Anthony Miller. Y'all know I love Anthony Miller. But I'm actually going to stack. Actually, this is that's ignorant. I'm not going to stack. Uh, I'm not going to stack Deshaun Jackson right now just because of the off the field concerns. We, he could end up getting fucking cut next week because of the shit that he's saying off the field. Um, I like the Deshaun Jackson Carson Wentz stack though because we saw how dynamite they were last year in Week One. Deshaun Jackson could stay healthy. We knew that he needed surgery, right? Doctor Morse came on the channel immediately and was like, Week One. This hip thing that he's dealing with needs surgery. Otherwise, it's just going to linger the entire year. Got the surgery offseason, and now he is back, hopefully fully healthy. If we can get 80% of what Deshaun Jackson was going to be last year, we'll be very excited with that in the 10th round. I also like Anthony Miller. I stacked. I didn't stack him with Allen Robinson. Had I take Robinson, I definitely would not have taken Miller there because, again, we don't stack on shitty teams. Uh, we'll go back to the running back thing. and I'm at, Yeah, I'm going to go with Zach Moss here. I just don't trust any of the other guys to be productive week over week, but I do with Zach Moss. He was one of my favorite prospects coming out, too, until the NFL Combine hit. He was fun to watch. He was ridiculously productive in college, an unbelievable amount of touchdowns, really, really elusive. One of one of the, if not the highest graded elusive running back per PFF, he's just kind of slow, and he's kind of a plotter, but he has the size, too. He's like 5'10", I believe, 220-something. So if they're, if, you know, if, uh, if they want to keep giving him carries and getting him more and more involved, he might flash some big plays and, and start to earn more time on the field. I know Singletary was really exciting last year, but, um, but clearly they have a role in mind for both guys and either one can end up having a, a role that grows. So I think you want to, uh, get a piece of that backfield on a very run heavy offense. And I'll take the one that's going five, six rounds later in Zach Moss. So we have our wide receivers. We have a bunch of running backs and whatnot. I think I might take a, another tight end here because this is something I've been I've been preaching pretty much the entire summer is that, you know, I did get Mark Andrews, so this might not apply. But if you are going to wait on tight end and had I gone Allen Robinson there and, and grabbed another tight end like a Tyler Higby here or something, I'm definitely grabbing a second one. I'm very, very much OK rostering two tight ends. And right now, Jonah Smith is definitely my favorite left on the board. I think he has maybe not a, a lot of upside, but if he's going to be the second target in this Tennessee offense, I think he presents a pretty good opportunity there uh, to kind of have, have a nice breakout year. We've seen how explosive he is. We know his athletics are off the charts, and he's been someone that we've been high on for a couple of years now. And now with Delaney Walker out of there, we can finally start getting actually excited that he's going to be a full-time player. So I will I will very gladly roster two tight ends, giving you the double chance of the breakout. Because every year, it seems like, or at least for the past couple of years, we've been like, oh, tight ends getting kind of deep. There are a lot of guys I like, and just like 90% of them bust. So give yourself double the shot of that happening. Because uh, if you don't do that, it's going to be tough. I remember last year, like I, I drafted one tight end, and uh, I drafted Hawkinson in the E-Town get down. And he had that killer first week, and I'm like, let's fucking go. Oh, no, I think I'm lying right now. I don't I don't remember who I drafted in the tight end. Someone probably remembers the E-Town Get Down vlogs and uh, can tell me who I drafted at tight end last year. But it was um, – sorry, I'm just going to make my pick here. 
it was not good. And I remember after the first week, I was like, I'm going to need to get another tight end. And I missed on Hawkinson and I missed on Waller in free agency in the in the fab bids. And I missed out on both guys. Had I just drafted another high end upside guy, obviously Hawkinson didn't work out, but Waller was actually my preferred choice there. Had I got Waller, shit would have been fucking nice last year. So um, I'm definitely okay getting a mid tier tight end, but I would probably rather stack up like two, like a jo- uh, Jonah Smith and a Hunter Henry or a Jonah Smith and a Hayden Hurst rather than using like a six round pick on a middle guy like Hunter Henry, though. I love fucking Darren Waller this year. Smash Darren Waller everywhere. Give yourself double the chance. Uh, I took Nikhil Harry because who knows? Maybe he becomes like the Devin Funches of Cam Newton's eye with a lot more athleticism. Where should Cam Newton be going? Oh, he's not even. He, he went to the, in the 12th round. I think he's a great pick as well. He's going to be ranked inside my top 12 quarterbacks for sure. Uh, this ADP is probably not real time adjusted. So I'd say in a month, Cam Newton will probably be going around where like Aaron Rodgers and Josh Allen are going there. So we'll let that slide. I'm good not drafting another quarterback. I do like the idea of the tight ends, though, just because with quarterbacks, it's like there are too many options to choose that will be fine for you. But with tight ends, there are just none to choose. That's the difference between playing the waiver for quarterbacks and tight ends. This last pick, uh, I don't hate Hunter Renfro. I don't really care. I'm not going to do any mock drafts with defenses or kickers. Sorry for that. Uh, What the fuck did they just draft Joe Burrow for me? Whatever. I ain't mad about it. If you are taking a guy like Wentz, maybe it's worth taking a second quarterback just for injury concerns if you have a high upside guy like Burrow sitting there at the end of the draft. But defenses, one quick note, one quick note. If you are in a dynasty league and you play with defenses, Kansas City Chiefs, Kansas City Chiefs. Guys, it might not make sense. Counterintuitive, but these are where the winning type of stats come into play. Kansas City was awesome for fantasy last year. And this Patrick Mahomes contract, which we're talking about in tomorrow's Fade the Public in depth, this Patrick Mahomes contract means that every defense is going to be letting up a ton of points against them for the next 10 years, which means every offense is going to have to score 28 plus, 30 plus, 35 plus to keep up with Mahomes' offense for the next 10 years, which means on the flip side, you want fantasy defenses that go against a lot of passing. Because that means sacks, that means interceptions. You don't just want fantasy defenses that allow 17 points per game. That's great, but you can't depend on that. What you can depend on are production via sacks and interceptions because of dropbacks. Pick sixes, sacks, interceptions, those come from teams having to score a lot. Those come from teams having to pass a lot. So if you're in a dynasty startup and you play with defenses, Kansas City will be that team that no one else is targeting that y'all should be targeting. That's all I got for y'all today. Please make sure you hit the thumbs up button if y'all enjoyed. Please make sure you subscribe if you are new to the channel. Please leave a comment below about what you thought about my team, what you would do differently. Again, I probably would have went with Allen Robinson instead of Mark Andrews there at the third turn. But being on the turn, you know, you kind of have to get your guys sometimes. You kind of have to reach a little bit. Um, And that's what I had to do. We love Mark Andrews, so we went with him. But in hindsight, yes, I would have went with a tight end probably around six or seven. Paired him up with Jonu Smith later in the draft and then had Allen Robinson as our starter. And life would have been zam good. So, again, if you enjoyed, thumbs up, subscribe. If you want more big facts, bigdogsdraftguide.com. For those of y'all that can't get the Monkey Knife Fight promo, if you're in a state that's eligible for the Monkey Knife Fight promo, which is a list on their FAQ section of their website, monkeyknifefight.com, deposit $10 with the promo code BDGE, play a game on their website, and within 24 hours, I will email you access to the draft guide. I love y'all. Make sure you stay tuned. And watch tomorrow's Fade the Public video. We got another fun one for yous. Peace.